Good evening. We uh, are continuing our study on uh, Christian influence, and uh, we've had, this. I think this is our fifth class uh, that we've had, and before we, uh, we go into a little review of that, assuming this is set up properly, we have to go over our homework. Remember, what was the homework I gave you last time? You were going to go into the parking lot of a, I mean, when, not just to hang out in the parking lot, but <laughs> when next time you went to Publix or, or to uh, Walmart or to uh, wherever you shop, where they have shopping carts, it's not hard to find little shopping carts all over the place. And your job was to go find a cart, and instead of leaving it there, you're just going to take it back inside. And we're going to talk a little, not tonight, we're not going to talk about it, but a little later on, we're going to talk about why I'm having you do all these crazy things. So, uh, just so you know, my wife and I did participate in this. We, uh, we bagged five carts. So, my wife was diligent. She, she took one the longest distance. It was in front of an office depot, and it was a cart from, from uh, uh, TJ Maxx. So, she had to walk halfway across the complex to take it back. So... She gets an A-plus for what she did. Mine was a little more like it was in the spot where I wanted to park, and it was just easy to take it, take it back. So uh, you'll get another uh, homework assignment uh, a little later on. But let's talk for a minute just about uh, what we've been, where, where we've been, what we've been doing. We've, we've had uh, four lessons so far. We talked a little bit about uh, Christian influence and why we were going to study it. We talked about what influence is. Remember, we, we, just, we talked about the fact that when people see you and interface with you, it's not only the things that you say, but it's the things that you do, the way you react, your body language, a whole variety of things can influence uh, other people in either a positive way or in a negative way. When we think of influence, it can go both ways. So we have to be careful when we're around people, what they see, and what, how we behave ourselves in front of those individuals. Uh, we talked about some of, sometimes it's a conscious act and other times it's unconscious on your part. You're not even aware that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, the second lesson we talked about being uh, after the Beatitudes, when we got into the few verses after that, it talks about you're supposed to be the salt of the earth. And we talked about salt and the characteristic of salt and how that's kind of a parallel or similar to uh, some of the characteristics we're supposed to have as Christians. And then we also, the next week, talked about uh, light. You know, you go down a little bit further, you were supposed to be the light of the world. And where does that light supposed to be placed? It's like a city that's up on top of a hill. And what don't we do with the light? light. You don't cover it up. You don't cover it with, as it says in the scripture, you don't cover it with a bushel. You don't cover it up. It needs to be seen, and, and that's how your influence uh, works the same way. You can't cover those kinds of things up. Last week, we talked a little bit about uh, leavening, leavening, which is the agent that we put in when we, when we bake things that makes it, things rise. We talked about all different kinds of leavening, but the idea that we as Christians can, can actually function in two ways. One, as the leavening itself, where when we're when we have opportunities, we can, we can make things happen uh, inside other things. But also, God's word is the leavening that's provided to us. And sometimes we're not the leavening itself, but we're the agent that delivers that leavening to other, other people. So those are the kind, that's just a, a one minute, two minute review of where we've been the last couple weeks. So uh, tonight, uh, I guess... Uh, how many of you were here Sunday night for, uh, for David's lesson? Well, I was innocently sitting over there, probably near where Scott's sitting over there with my wife, and we're sitting there. Normally, my, part of my job is I coordinate the worship service, so I generally know all the things that are going on with the service. I usually know what the scripture reading is. Occasionally, when things are hectic, I'll have the person who has the scripture reading go directly to the preacher and get the scripture reading from the preacher, and I don't know what it is, but that's fairly rare. But last Sunday evening, I had to do that. I needed Scott Studer to go and get the, the scripture from David, so I didn't know what it was. So Scott got up there, 
to read the scripture, and as soon as it popped up on the screen, my wife will tell you what I said. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> remember what the scripture reading was? Does anybody remember what it is? 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. You are an epistle. My lesson got hijacked by the preacher. <laughs> the lesson we're having tonight is on acting like you are an epistle. So since he already covered it, we're going to have a closing prayer and then you all can go home. <laughs> Maybe not. We'll probably do a quick review of some of the things that David had to say. I have a few other thoughts and ideas and then I want to get to a couple of things uh, later on. So when we look at... Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, it says, Do we again, or do we, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do, do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Cl- clearly, You are an epistle of Christ, ministers by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. That was what Scott read, and we're going to use this. This is the last lesson that we're going to have in this this series that we're talking about. We've been talking about metaphors, salt, light. Eleven, we're talking about uh, you functioning kind of like an, an epistle does, and it comes from from these verses. So, if you remember what David presented in the lesson, the first thing that he presented was the idea that uh, the material that when you uh, when you put an epistle together, you have to put it down on paper. For the most part, on this day and age, you can you can uh, you can do it differently, but back then. You know, they either use papyrus or they use some kind of animal skin, something that they were right on. But you had to take whatever it is that was going to be you were going to write on, and it had to be processed. It's much like what we do today with David made the point he talked about paper that we use. We don't write on trees. You don't go out and write on a tree, but we use, really we do write on trees because the paper that we we use comes from trees for the most part, and so. Materials, if you think about being an epistle, it has to be written on something that's changed. Now, in in, uh, 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 and 17, it tells us that that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. God has given us the guidelines that he wants us to live by. He's given us, he hasn't, he hasn't left it up to us to decide what those things are, but he's given this to us. And the only way that what's in here, I think I said this a couple weeks ago, the only way this gets in here is there has to be some sort of change that occurs in the person when they, when they come in contact with this and when they receive it. And if you think about uh, when Mike, who I think did an excellent job, see in here? Well, if you don't, afterwards, if you see him, tell him how, what a really good job he did on the invitation tonight. That was very, very good. Uh, but when you look at those steps of uh, salvation, you know, faith, you know, and what else is going to kick in? Faith. What are the steps of salvation? Oh. Repent. 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 Confession. Confession. Baptism. Baptism. Living faithfully. Those are the steps that we go through, and you can't hear, you can't take those steps unless you hear it first, and that faith has to, has to do something, it has to change something. What does is, what is faith change? It changes your heart. So if we look at these, the steps for just a second, faith changes a person's heart, changes uh, not this heart, but the, your, your Bible heart, your up here. Repentance, what does repentance change? But ultimately, if you make a, a decision to change, you're really changing your behavior. So faith changes your heart. Repentance changes your behavior. What's baptism change? Changes your state. 
the, the state that you're in between you and God. You know, you're outside of Christ, but when you're baptized, you're inside with Christ. So when we go through those steps, you know, faith changes your heart. Repentance changes your behavior. Baptism changes your state. And ultimately, it produces a new life. And I brought this as kind of an illustration. I don't want to mix metaphors because uh, this isn't something that you would write a letter on. But uh, when, you're, uh, when you're baptized, when you come out of that water, uh, I, I, I've spent a lot of time on this particular uh, illustration. Uh, drawing really isn't my greatest uh, skill, but uh, I want you to know this is exactly what you're, you're, this is exactly what you look like when you come out after you're baptized. Clean, clean, clean. Pure as the driven snow. Now, some folks have a mistaken idea that, you know, for instance, let's say, how many of you have ever uh, gone to a, done any kind of prison work where you go to prisons and you try and teach folks? Uh, done that a little bit. Bet you you've done some of that. Uh, it, it, change, it takes all your, your sins away. It changes your relationship with God. You're outside of God, now you're inside you know, of, of Christ. But unfortunately, some of the things that we do in life, you know, when you're baptized, does it take away the, the circumstances or the consequences of some of the things that you did? No. So, if, for instance, if you're in prison because you uh, robbed a bank, when you're, uh, when you're baptized, if you're in prison and we're able to baptize you, does the warden walk down and say, that's great, there's the door, see you later? No. Doesn't happen. Sometimes those consequences that we have, we have to live with for probably the rest of our life. There's a lot of things that, that have that, those kinds of consequences. But the relationship that you have with God, you know, when man looks at it, they see a lot of those defects. When God looks at it, he sees, he looks at it initially like this. Does it stay that way? Probably not. I mean, I don't know anyone who's perfect. You know, people, we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And he gave us a, a way to, uh, to handle those things, which is what? Ask we can ask for forgiveness. And we, we do it, you can do it every night when you, when, you, when, you, if you, when you pray. Or you can do it you can do it in the morning when you pray. You can do it in the afternoon when you pray. You can do it here. You can come forward and do it. And depending upon what their need is and what you've done, determines how it is that you're, you need to, uh, to undertake that. David's lesson also talked about when there is an epistle that's put together, there has to be an author. In other words, the words just don't appear on the page. There has to be someone who writes that epistle. And in this case, your life, if you're going to live your life as an epistle, as, and we'll get to that in just a minute, how that sort of fits in, but if you're going to live your life that way, um, who's the author? If you're an epistle, who's the author? Okay. Are you involved in it at all? I, I, you know, I don't know how you want to think about it. Some people want to say God is the author and you're just, you're just part of it, but I don't think it works that way myself. I think of it more in terms of uh, we're kind of co-authors. But if you were to put a cover, if it was a book, your name would be the little print at the bottom, and God's name would be the big name that's, that everyone would recognize. You're co-authoring your life with God. Once you become a Christian, the two of you, you know, we're working together. It's a, it's a, it's a partnership that we're working together, and we're both going to be the authors of your life from that point forward. You know, we're told that uh, we're supposed to have the mind of Christ in Philippians uh, 2 and 5, and that Christ is supposed to be something that lives in, lives in us in Galatians 2 and 20. So we have to change in order to be an epistle. We have to, we have to change. We have to have an author, and then we're going to co-author our life with God. And then how does, a, how does an epistle work? I write, I, write some, I write a letter to somebody and I send it. What makes this whole process work? I'm not talking about the post office. I'm talking about, okay, the letter goes, 
there has to be someone I'm communicating with. There has to be someone who's going to read it. If I write something and no one ever looks at it, and there's, nothing ever happens as a result of it, it's, it's kind of a futile activity. So there's always the need for an author and for someone who's going to read it as well. Uh, when, we're, uh, when we're writing, or when we're reading it, that what, what's the need for there to be God's word in the world? Why is there a need for God's word? Because what is the world? What's the status of the world? It's lost and dying. It's a lost and dying world that we live in. And every person that's in this world is subject to, the, to that lost and dying world. And we need to have that partnership with Christ if we're going to function as an epistle. Uh, and the audience, you know, it, it says that we're supposed to function in a world. It's not just myself and this person here. It's the whole world. The whole world is an opportunity for us to function as this epistle. That's kind of the, the subjects that David covered very broadly, although he used uh, significantly more scriptures and said it much more eloquently than I said it. But there's a couple of things I want to add to it that uh, he didn't touch upon. When you, uh, when you send something to someone, what, what is it you're trying to do when you send a letter to somebody else? Communicate. You're trying to communicate. You're trying to convey an idea or a thought or ask a question. There's a reason why you send, you don't write, Dear Jane, love Fred. <laughs> There's context to it. There's a reason why you sent that communication to somebody. And we need to be aware of the fact that when we're functioning as an epistle, there has to be some reason why we are that epistle. We're conveying a message as an epistle. I'm gonna, I've got a, uh, I think I've got it here, a poem. This one, I ran across this. This is a really neat description of this. Um, let me just read it to you. It's, There's a sweet old story translated from men but writ in the long ago. The gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of Christ and his mission below. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds you do, by the words you say. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Yes, what is the gospel according to you? Tis a wonderful story, this gospel of love, as it shines in Christ, li Christ's life divine. And oh, that it's true might be spoken again in the story of your life and mine. You are writing each day a letter to men. Take care that the writing is true. Tis the only gospel some men will read, the gospel according to you. When I read that, that really, I think, says that, that it's almost a summary of what this lesson is all about. It's you're living a life that people get to see. You don't live it in, in secret. You, you're out there in the world and you're doing various things. That's part of the reason why, the, the, why I'm trying to get you to talk to people you don't normally talk to, use their name, I'm trying to get you to do things that people see you doing, not to be seen of men but just to, to, to do things that other people don't do. It wouldn't be like the, the shopping cart, for instance. Why do you think I asked you to do the shopping cart? Because somebody might see you doing it. Because who, who else is doing that? <laughs> oh, okay. if, if other people were doing it, would there be carts all over the parking lot? No. I, I mean, I did, there was one parking lot I went into that I couldn't find a cart. I was very disappointed, but I think they had just, the cart guy had just gone through. Trudy. Did you see your kindness and your generosity and love of, of making the same, may I have your cart, Alan, please get to it, or take your customers for the reply afterwards? Okay. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying, I, I don't want you to do it to be seen of men, but I want you to be seen by other men for a different reason. I want you, you know, if you don't like 
driving in the parking lot and trying to park and there's a cart in there, the only way that's ever going to change is if people stop putting the carts there and take them back or put them in the cart corral or wherever. So why don't we be the ones that do that? So, and you'll notice the ones that you find are usually further away from the door. So you're going to have to park further away when, we, when you do this. What's another factor that, that when you think of, of an epistle is when you read it, in order for it to be effective, it has to be easy to read and you have to be able to understand it. If you ever had somebody send you something and you read it and you go, what? <laughs> what, what is this? I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what it is. If the message isn't clear and simple and easy to understand, a lot of times it just goes right over your head. So that's a lesson to us in a couple ways. One, when we're trying to communicate things to other people, we need to be, you know, if you're worried about coming off sounding eloquent and intelligent, you, you may be, be, pull that off, but they may need a thesaurus to read it, and it's not going to get you what, what you're looking for. You really need, when, you, when you're doing communication, you need to be f focused on easy to understand, uh, easy to read. Uh, if you think about it, if you're an epistle, you are functioning as an epistle. I, I thought of uh, Acts 4.13, where this is at the, near the beginning of when Jesus is starting his, uh, his work. He's, he's starting to uh, go out and he's starting to gather together the apostles. And, and obviously Jesus, when he picked these men out, he went to the finest universities and, and the gentlemen's clubs, and he got the finest men that he could find, right? No. no. He got fishermen. He got a publican, was a tax collector. He got a whole variety of men that were considered to be uneducated, not that intelligent. And what happened when, when these men, if you look in, in Acts uh, 4 and verse 13, you, you see the people going, isn't that John? Isn't he... He's not, he's not that intelligent. I mean, he's un uneducated, untrained. Well, how, how is he able to speak this way? Well, he's, be he, he's being used as an epistle. He's being seen of people, and people are, are seeing what he does, and, and it's making a difference. One other point I want to make, and then I want to get into some, uh, a, a couple things up here. If you think about being an epistle... If you send me a letter and I get it, I don't, know if, I, I don't know how you do your mail. I generally let my wife get the mail because she doesn't like the way I do the mail. So when I get the mail, I come, come and I stand next to the trash can. And you get about two, three seconds worth of my time because I go trash, 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 trash. She doesn't function that way. She likes to go through it and stuff. But... When somebody sends you something like a letter and you open it up and go, and you read it and you go, doom, 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 throw, it, throw it in the garbage can. Whatever it is that you are, whatever it is that you do, you need to be memorable. Because there's no guarantee when you, if you're going to function as an epistle, eventually you are going to disappear. I'm going to disappear. We're all going to disappear. Save Christ coming back before, you know, we reach that point in our life. So as an epistle, at some point, you as an epistle, you're going to be kind of the, get, get crumpled up and you're going to be set aside. And that's why it's important that the things that you do need to be something that people can remember. And we're going to have a lesson later on about, uh, it, it's kind of a spin, I don't know if John would remember this, Frank Crispin, who was the preacher over at the Gardens Church of Christ a long, long, long time ago, little man about this big, got up there, <laughs> and I, I, you can remember certain lessons that you've heard from the pulpit before. He got up there, and you can, you know, when Frank would stand up behind the pulpit, you could see maybe this much of him, and he gets up there, and his hand comes up, and he goes, boom, and he bangs it down, and it's a, su it's a suction cup that's got a flag on it. And if you remember, I don't think they do it anymore, but it used to be when you had funerals, 
they put these little suction cup things on your car with a little flag that said funeral so that when you were driving in the procession that people would know that you were a part of the, the, the crew that was going to the cemetery in the most part. Well, Frank got up there and sticks this flag up there that says funeral on it, and he says, welcome to your funeral. And he began, he, he started talking about what's your eulogy going to be? And he went through the whole thing. It was, it was one of the most amazing sermons I've ever heard. It was just, it really made you stop and think about what or what's going to happen when you're gone, what kind of influence will you have had, and what will people be thinking about you? You shouldn't, you shouldn't worry about it in the sense that there's some people who are going to go, you know, Mike, he was, he was a real toad, you know? And we tried to get him to go out to drink, and he wouldn't do that, and, you know, he wouldn't do this, and, you know, there's people who aren't going to like what you do if you do all the right things. I'm not worried about that. I'm just hoping that there can be some sort of positive influence for the, for the I've been here 61 years, you know, maybe I get a few more, you know, 60, 70, 80 years, however many years I get. I'd like to think at the end of that, there's a good reason why God put me here and that, that it had some kind of positive influence in some, some place or some time. So you've got to remember that as you function as this epistle, eventually it, it goes away. And what's the residue that gets left behind from that? Okay, we're going to look at uh, some characteristics. If you're going to be functioning as this uh, epistle... I want to start with the, call them the knots, not K-N-O-T-S, not tying a knot, but knots as in knot. Uh, I tried to pick out some, uh, some scriptures that we're all familiar with. I didn't want to pick out some obscure thing that you hadn't heard of before or wherever, but it's not hard. When you start looking at, if you're trying to think about the characteristics you ought to have or the things you ought to do or not do, there, there are plenty of lists of things in the Bible that, that help you understand some of this. This first one comes from uh, Galatians 5, uh, 19 through 21. It should be fairly familiar to you. It's uh, the works of the flesh. And when you're going to function as this epistle for other people, they're going to be looking at you and like it said in that poem, sometimes the only thing they'll ever see, they'll never crack a Bible in their life, but the only exposure they might have it is their exposure to you. So what are you going to, what, what are the things that we ought to do and what are the things that we ought to not do? These are the knots. I started with the knots. Some of these things you're going, okay, Mike. Uh, some of these things like adultery, fornication, people, I mean, you're not going to, we don't have scarlet letters anymore. You're not going to be walking around with a scarlet letter, people knowing that you're an adulterer. But people know a lot of things about you that you don't think that they know about you. And a lot of the things that are on here, uh, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. You know, people go, idolatry? Oh, I don't know anybody that's got an idol in their house. Well, idolatry in Christ's time was one thing. If you don't think we have idolatry today, then you haven't really thought about it too, too much. Is your car more important than coming to church? What, what, what's the thing, what are the things that pull you away from the things that you, God wants you to focus on? When something's more important than God, and you can come up with a reason for it, that's a form of idolatry. We need to be aware of that, and other people will see that. Uh, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Anybody have temper issues? Um, some people do, some people don't. Uh, but when you get mad, how do you get mad? I mean, it's okay, to, it's okay to get upset, but how do you do it? And when you do it in front of other people, what does it look like? Uh, heresies, envies. I don't think we have any murderers. I'm not too concerned about the murdering part here. Uh, drunkenness, rival, revelries. Uh, next one is uh, from Romans 1, 29, 31. Some additional items that we need to avoid. Uh, unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters. It's an interesting list because when you start looking at this list, all these things God hates. 
you know, we tend, to, we tend to try and put them on a hierarchical basis. It's like, well, murder is really, really bad. But if I'm down here in the uh, backbiter category or a gossiper or whatever, those, those things, well, in God's eyes, that's, those are all of equal, equal value in terms of he doesn't want you doing those things. And we shouldn't be seen doing those things. The, you know, the ones at the end, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. These all play to this, this idea of can, can people trust you? You know, what, what kind of demeanor do you have? Are you willing to forgive other people? Are you, are you uh, a merciful individual? The next one uh, comes from Revelations uh, 21 and 8, where it says, it has an additional list, it says cowardly, unbelieving, uh, we have murder back in there again, sexual immorality is back in there again, sorcery, idolatry. And the reason I put it in there is the last one, liars. When you lie once, it's bad. When somebody finds out that you lied, it's even worse because what happens when you lie to somebody? When you tell them the next thing, they're going to be going what? Is that true or is that not true? And you have to have a spectacular memory to be a good liar, don't you? Yeah. You, ha- you have to remember all the details of your lie. It's just easier to tell the truth. Yes. Okay, the, the next one is probably one, I, before I un- uncover it, I guarantee you this next one, every person in this room has a problem with. And if you don't think you have a problem with this, then you have a problem. <laughs> An unbridled tongue. In James chapter 3, if you start reading at the beginning of the chapter and you go almost through the entire thing, it talks about this little thing that resides in your mouth called the tongue. And it's compared to a lot of different things. It's, it's like it's compared to a tiller on a boat. You know, a boat is very big and you have the rudder in the back or a tiller. And that little rudder or tiller you know, moves that big ship around. It talks about how it's, your tongue is similar to a fountain that, you know, it, it produces sweet water and also sour water. You know, out of your mouth proceeds what? Both blessings and cursing. I think we've all been guilty of letting something come out of our mouth that we probably shouldn't have done. I, I can't, I mean, I, I trying to think, I've probably done two or three things this week. I probably said something that I shouldn't have said. Uh, it's something that we all have to be very careful with. What proceeds out of your mouth, people hear. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and once, once they hear it, it's hard to unhear unkind things. So we have to be careful with our tongue. Here's another one. Who are you hanging with? <laughs> we tend to think of the people that we... Uh, it, it's funny when you think about who, who are your friends and where do they reside. You know, are they, in my neighborhood, the houses are really far apart. The, the lots are like an acre, acre and a quarter, and the houses are pretty far away. And I know the names of the, the neighbors, but it isn't like when I grew up in the house over in North Palm Beach. You know, my, everybody knew everybody. You know, the parents knew all the kids. The kids knew all the parents. If you did something... Down at the end of the street, before you got home, your mom knew about it. Uh, but that isn't the way it works, and, and a lot of us don't even know our own neighbors. But who are you hanging with? And what kind of influence, not only are you having on them, but what kind of influence are they having on you? It flows both directions. Because you know, e- evil companionship corrupts good morals, or I think one of the translations has habits. You know, we, we, can be, we can be corrupted. By simply by hanging out with the wrong people. I threw this one in because I think you need another list. Once again, it has, uh, you, get, you start getting the trend here that there's a lot of uh, sexual things that are, uh, you need to be careful about. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, revelers, and extortioners. I really put it in for the, for the thieves and the extortioners. We have to be careful what we do and how we do it in front of people. When, as it relates to how we handle things. Yeah. You know, uh, when you're a kid, I, I remember my wife told me a story that when she was, a, you don't mind me telling this story, when she was a little girl, she went into a store 
when she was real little and took a lollipop, wasn't it? Or a, no, it was a, a, a shampoo with a character's head on it. Oh, okay, shampoo with a character's head. And she got it home and her mom found out that she had it. Guess where she went? <laughs> she went back to the store with her mom and had to return it and she had to talk to the manager and tell her, tell him what she did and that she was sorry and then when she went home she got punished. So, uh, first, it's funny, 1 Corinthians 13 we think of, of as the love chapter but there's a lot of not, knots in there. I mean, there's, it talks about not being envious, not parading yourself around, not being puffed up, don't be rude or selfish, easily provoked, or an evil thinker. There, there are some things that warns you not to be like. And then this last one I put in here, in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and also in Titus 1, there are the qualifications for, well, in, in Timothy it's qualifications for elders and for deacons, and then in, in Titus it's the qualifications for just elders. But when you look at those qualifications, there isn't a single qualification in there that you and I aren't also supposed to be doing. There's not some, they're not just some special group of things that you have to do to be an elder or a deacon. All those things that are on that list are things that we're supposed to do. Well, some of the things that are listed on there are positives and some of them are things that you're not supposed to do. These are the nots. And that's supposed to be given to wine, violence, greedy for money, quarrelsome, covetous, full of pride, uh, slander, or self-will. It's that last one's an interesting one. It comes from a Greek word, alphades, which means, it means more than just you know, wanting stuff for yourself. It means that you are constantly possessed with the idea that you want, you want things for yourself. It goes way beyond just a little thing. It's, it's, a, it's a practice that you, that, you, that you undertake. Well, let's move away from the knots and move to the when people see you, let's talk about the positives. Where are the things that we, we want, to, if we're going to be an epistle, where are the things that, that we want to uh, be seen? We need to be from uh, the Beatitudes. We need to be humble, gentle, merciful, peaceful, sincere. And the last one is really the last two pieces where it talks about when you're persecuted. If you're going to be an epistle, the one thing that goes along with being an epistle is you're going to get persecuted. You're going to have people say all manner of things about you. And I think we talked about this last week, and when I said it, several people winced. There's persecution and there's persecution. Here somebody's going to call you a name or they're, or they're going to say something about you. You go someplace else in the world, they're going to cut off your head. Mm. There's persecu- If you think you're, you're, you're getting persecuted in a certain way, it's nothing like what some other people are going through. Mm. So we need to uh, have that spiritual courageousness. From Galatians 5, 22, those are the, that's the fruit of the Spirit. The items are listed there. It's supposed to be loving, joyous, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and have self-control. Uh, it also talks in Ephesians 5, 9 about, uh, and it's talking about the, the fruit of the Spirit, and it also adds in their righteousness and tr- being truthful. Uh, Second Peter Chapter 2, verses, or 2 Peter 1, verses 5 and 8, 5 through 8. You know, add your faith, virtue. You remember that, that scripture? It's being faithful, being virtuous, uh, knowledgeable, self controlled, steadfast, godly, having brotherly kindness, and being a loving person. Going back to those qualifications for uh, elders and deacons, they need to be blameless, temperate, sober minded, hospitable, willing to teach, gentle holy, just, self-controlled, and faithful. Uh, if you want to go back to the, or to the, to the love chapter, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about, about you need to be patient. Love suffers long and is kind. You know, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And the bottom line of the whole thing is, is what? Love never Thanks. fails. You're dependable. Uh, James, going to James three seventeen, I I coined that term. It's not in there. Applied wisdom. It's talking about when wisdom comes down from above. It has these characteristics. But if we're going to be a 
uh, an epistle, we need to have those same characteristics. We need to be pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, uh, good fruit, without partiality or hypocrisy. When people figure out that you're, you, aren't, you say some, one thing and you do something else, that's a problem. It's going to be difficult to be a positive influence on somebody when what comes out of your mouth doesn't match what you do. Being uh, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the... Oh. Okay, well. What I want to get to is uh, the last one, because I think it's pretty important. James chapter 1, 19, and then in verse 22, where it says, you are to be... Uh, let, me, let me introduce it this way. Why did God give you two ears and one mouth? Because you pretty much ought to listen twice as much as you talk. And, it, and in James it says what? You are to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And then you go down to verse 22 and it says that you're supposed to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. So as an epistle, uh, that, that's really the bottom line. Is you, I want you to be, think about being a doer of the word and not a hearer only if we're going to function in that capacity. Homework for next week. Last week was uh, basic, was a basic uh, shopping cart. I don't know if that other one's going to come up or not. I guess I got cut off. We're going, we're going, we're moving up to advanced cart, shopping cart. Everybody's cringing. Be brave. You know, you, ha you were able to talk to that person that you hardly ever talked to at the checkout counter. Now, this is your opportunity. We're going to take that shopping cart. We're not going to go find a cart that's... Well, you can still grab carts that are just around if you want to. I think that's probably a good thing. But I want you to, on purpose, go into a parking lot, park someplace so that there's somebody unloading their things into the car, and you time it so you get out and you get the cart, and you say, can I take that cart for you? I did that this week. Uh -huh. Well, some of you did. I gave you the option this week. You're, you're advanced, <laughs> Novell. You know, he's... He's, uh, he's way past where most people are. So last week was working with an inanimate object called a cart. Now I want you to interface with another human being and just say, can I take that cart for you? And see what happens. We, I, I know Karen had, had something that she did, uh, uh, Ted did, but she didn't want to share it. But she had an incident where they had the opportunity to take somebody's cart. So uh, we'll, I'll, well, they're going to be gone. In a couple of days, and then I'll share it with you when they're not here. I asked someone, I told someone, I mean, I asked someone, would you, would you let me take your cart? I went to Kmart. Okay, good. Kmart's a great place. There's so many carts everywhere. You can do it. You stay there all day and do it. We'll see you next week.